My name is Andrew Wilty, and today I want to talk to you guys about your first tournament and what to expect. So you're a white and a blue belt, you've been training for a little while, maybe you've been training for an extended period of time, but you've never done a competition. What's it going to be like? Am I going to lose in the first round? Am I going to gas out? Am I going to get nervous? Am I just going to forget all my techniques? So today I want to talk to you guys about tournament prep. I want to talk to you guys about what to expect and how to kind of manage some of these different things that are going to happen to you. <laughs> All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about is nerves and nerve management, okay? How nervous are you going to get? Not everybody gets extremely nervous. I get extremely nervous every single tournament. If I do a local Fuji, my heart rate spikes to a fucking thousand, okay? And this can have a detrimental impact on your match, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a little story. When I was 15 or 16... All right, I've been training judo for a couple of years with my coach Mike Ogden at the time, and it was kind of like this nogi judo class where we, we did some submission grappling a little bit. I, I knew I knew some basic submissions, I had some setups, and I was the best kid in the class. So I was starting to get a little bit ahead of myself. I was starting to get a little bit arrogant, maybe, and I was starting to think I was a little bit better than I was. I thought I couldn't really lose. So we signed me up for a submission grappling match during a cage show. And at this cage show, I realized I'm not the fucking top dog. <laughs> okay, I, I'm not even a guppy. I'm just this little tadpole in a tiny pond, and there's fucking sharks in the ocean. So I go out there. First thing I notice is this is the most scared I've ever been in my entire life. Okay, as I'm walking up to the cage, my legs are starting to feel heavy. I'm actually starting to get tired going up the steps to the cage. The announcer's kind of like t talking about my name and shit. And I'm starting to get tunnel vision. Okay, you know, normally you see out here, I, I fucking had this. I had nothing. And what I could see was blurry and the lights were bright. And I was like, oh God, why am I even doing this? So I go out there and I tie up with the guy. And in the first, I don't know, five seconds, I kind of hit a foot sweep on him. He goes off balance a little bit, leans back. And then off of him leaning back, he corrects himself and flying arm bars me. And I had so much adrenaline in my system that I couldn't feel the arm bar. My arm was fully extended. So I spent the next 20 to 30 seconds trying to fight my way out of this arm bar with my arm fully extended, just getting fucking rice crispy. I mean, full on snap, crackle and pop. And it, I it didn't win. I had to tap. So my first match that I ever did, I went out there and embarrassingly got tapped out in the first fucking 30 seconds. And the worst part about it was I told all the kids at school I was going to easily win. <laughs> And that, that turned out to not be the case. So I had to go back to school the fucking following Monday, arms in a sling. What happened, Andrew? Did you win? Haha, ha, you said you were going to win. No, I didn't fucking win, motherfuckers. Get away from me. So let's talk about how much of an impact that had on my career. Okay, one, it motivated me to fucking train my ass off and win my second match that I ever did in dominating fashion. Okay, but it gave me a good perspective on how easy it is to mess up and lose and how nerves really man matter when, you're, when it comes to competition and nerve management is a real thing. And the other things that it did was it gave me, like, serious perspective on training in general. Did it actually impact my career that much, though, to lose like that? Does anyone remember... I mean, maybe the kids in my high school remember, you know, maybe the guys I was training with at the time remember. I remember, but no one else even has to know about this if I would just stop telling the story about me getting my ass kicked, okay? Here's the lesson I want you guys to take away from this. Nobody fucking cares when you lose, okay? People remember when you win. And if you compete enough, you're eventually going to have that win, especially if you manage to pull off a win in a major tournament, okay? You remember your losses, and your losses can only impact you as much as you let them. So you're going into your first tournament, you're nervous, Let's. what are you worried about? You're worried you're going to lose, right? You're worried you're going to embarrass yourself. No one's going to remember it as being as embarrassing as you, and again, you have control over your thoughts and how you kind of react to stuff. You can make it less embarrassing just by realizing no one gives a fuck, okay? When you go back and you dominantly win your second tournament, that's what they're going to remember. Everything is a learning experience as long as you learn from it. So the best thing you can do if you do go out there and get your ass kicked is just analyze why you got your ass kicked. Did you get tired? Did you get nervous? Did you, uh, did you miss your move? Did you place your hand in the wrong spot? You know, what actually happened? And it, the, we learn not from failure, but from the analyzing our failures. Okay, we learn from actually breaking it down, taking away chunks, and seeing what we did wrong and actually correcting that behavior in the future. So you don't have that much to worry about for getting nervous. Uh, it is going to affect your cardio, though. Okay, and that's going to be a problem. So let's talk about cardio for a second. 
your cardio is going to tank. And I mean this. I mean, you may roll semi-hard in class. Most people don't roll as hard as they could. Very few people roll at a tournament pace in their class setting. Okay, it's very rare. I've been all over the place. I don't see it very often. A tournament is going to be unlike anything you've ever done in your class for the most part. Unless you're really, you got a good gym and they do a lot of like middle match type settings where they put you out there against another guy your skill level and they have other people watching you so you can kind of recreate that hype you're going to get when you go out and do a tournament. And the problem is you're just not going to be ready for the pace that people are going to put on you in the tournament or the pace you're going to go without meaning to. And you're going to, you, what happens is you actually push the pace more than you're used to and you fatigue out so badly. Your cardio gets fucked up. Your muscular conditioning gets completely tanked. You, you get exhausted, okay? And that's normal for your first tournament. It's just because you're just not comfortable yet. You're probably not playing your game you're probably reacting to your opponent a little bit. Maybe your mind's kind of kind of fuzzing out a little bit, and that's okay. What can help you overcome these nerves and what can help you overcome this uh, exhaustion is make sure your cardio is on point, okay? If you're just showing up to class and you're just rolling at class, your cardio's not there. You've got to be doing some kind of cardio outside of this, and I would recommend doing a mixture of anaerobic and aerobic exercises. If you just want to break this down into like 10 second, Wiltsy's giving you what you should actually do, do circuit training. Now you do high intensity interval training for both, actually. So I do one minute per exercise circuits, okay, and I come up with 10 different exercises that moderate between like high intensity and mid intensity. So I'm doing something to spike my heart rate and I'm doing something to maintain my heart rate. An example of this would be sprawls. Sprawls and frog jumps are for spiking my heart rate. Jumping jacks and mountain climbers are for maintaining my heart rate, okay? And you want to find a middle place for your aerobic exercise. And I do 10 different exercises for one minute each, and I repeat the set three to four times so I can get 40 minutes of cardio out of this. For me, it's a lot easier on my body than running for 40 minutes or doing rowing or something like that. And I get the benefit of hitting a lot of different muscle groups and just teaching myself to move the whole time. It actually has a direct translation to jiu-jitsu. Now, for your anaerobic cardio, where you really exhaust yourself, I like to do 30 seconds at 100% with very few maintenance exercises in there. So I'll do uh, three to five minute rounds with 30 second exercises filling these rounds. So for example, frog jumps into sprawls. So you do frog jumps for 30 seconds as hard as you can, sprawls for 30 seconds as hard as you can, one, two, one, twos, you know, just full on sprint drills with the gloves, then you can do jumping jacks. At that point, you should be fucked up. I'm exhausted when I do this kind of stuff, and that's the point. You're actually trying to spike your heart rate as high as you can possibly go, so that way your body starts to actually adapt and fix itself, so you can not have that happen as bad in the future. So those are going to be your big things for your cardio. For your muscular conditioning, you should be lifting weights and you should be doing jiu-jitsu specific drills and exercises on people if you can at your gym or if you can get a bob dummy or something. The best way to gain muscular conditioning for jiu-jitsu is to think about time under contraction. Okay, that's the best way to really to, to think about it. People talk about reps. Do you do high reps? And that's also another way of thinking about it. But he, here's what I mean. Okay, if I'm trying to work on my ability to curl, okay, my, I don't want my, my biceps to be exhausting as much, I'm not going to do fast motion curls. Okay, I'm going to do slow reps. One. You know, as slow as I can possibly make them. Because you've got to contract your muscles for at least 30 seconds in order to have some kind of physiological change happen in the muscle. Okay, that's not to say neurological isn't going to happen. You're going to get stronger no matter what you do. You're going to get a little, a little more efficient at using your muscle groups no matter what you do. But if you want to change how your muscles kind of adapt to taking in oxygen and blood, you have to hit at least 30 seconds. And the, the higher you go, the better. So the slower you can do your reps, the more reps you can do, the better. And you want to have a full body workout if you can. You've got to make sure you hit your legs. The legs are the first thing that fatigue. You've got to hit your grips. Your grips are going to get fucking exhausted in your first tournament. That's the thing I always noticed. My forearms would get just completely gassed. So a lot of curling motions, a lot of squeezing motions, a lot of holding something like a dumbbell up in the air and walking around with it just to, get, to keep that contraction going. So that's going to make sure your cardio is on point. Now, you're still going to get exhausted if you haven't done some kind of middle matches. And the way to deal that is just ask your coach if you can do some middle matches, okay? Or ask someone if they'll do real matches with you where you'll try actually decently hard in the match, but you guys have to start standing, okay? And this brings me to the next point. It's going to be unfamiliarity with dealing with full matches in a competition setting, 
All right, what I mean by this is a lot of gyms don't start standing. A lot of gyms start on their knees most of the time, or one guy's playing guard, one guy's playing guard passing, and they don't really do full matches. You have to do a full match in order to tie together all of the different skill sets that you've been working on in isolation. You may have the best guard passing in the world, but can you chain it off of a takedown? Because that's when you're going to get the most benefit out of being a good guard passer, is off of something where your opponent hasn't had time to build their defenses yet. So buzzsaw. Okay, and again, you're going to be really unfamiliar with how hard they're going to go. So when you guys do your match, you have to tell your opponent, you know, tell your partner, go hard. Okay, don't let me grab you. Break my grips. Push my legs down. Shove me off. Push me. Put your hand in my face. You want them to recreate a tournament type match. And in tournaments, people go much harder than you're ready for. All right, another thing we got to talk about is weight management. So... You have to make sure you are on weight at certain tournaments. Most tournaments. All tournaments. So the IBGGF, if you're a .1 over when you get on their official scale, you are disqualified. You don't get a second chance. You don't get to take your shoes off. You are just fucked. Okay, so we have to make sure that we're on weight. So what's the best way to do this? So there's different strategies we can employ to make our life a little bit easier when it comes to getting down to our specific weight. Okay, the first thing you should do if you have the luxury of time and willpower, is you should fucking diet, okay? You should lose body fat until you are at least a pound under your weight class waking up in the morning, okay? If you can do this, you are doing the best available route. This is the best tactic you can do in order to make sure you're able to perform as well as possible on the day of the tournament. Now, this is not always an option. Maybe you took a tournament short notice. Maybe you just can't cut that much body fat. So we're going to have to make do by cutting water weight. Now, the worst thing you can do is start to cut water weight days out from the tournament. Okay. Though I want you to think about this. The less amount of time we can have that water out of our system, the better we're going to perform. So it's better to cut weight in the morning of the tournament than it is to cut it the night before. Okay. Now, Different weight cutting tactics that I've seen employed. Okay, I've seen people take a diuretic pill. I absolutely do not endorse or recommend that. What it does is it dehydrates you by making you urinate all of the water out of your system. Don't do that. That's fucking terrible for your heart. You'll die. Okay, you may die. <laughs> now, you can also get in a sauna. Or you can put a bunch of clothing on, put something heavy on, put a sauna suit on, and you can start to exercise. Now, if you're going to do that route, make sure you're doing exercises that don't burn your muscle groups out. Okay, so you shouldn't do like 100 push-ups if you're cutting weight in a sauna suit. Okay, you want to just alternate between muscle groups. So like jumping jacks, then do a few push-ups, then do some jumping jacks, and then do some, some uh, mountain climbers. Do stuff that's low impact on your muscles, but that raises your heart rate. Okay, you can also drill and warm up that way and sweat that way. You can get a few rolls in, but again, you've got to really monitor how much muscular fatigue you're going to be adding to yourself. You don't want to burn out before you do your matches in the tournament. Now, you can do stuff like cut uh, protein and sugar and sodium out of your diet the couple days, three, four days out from the tournament, you know, no carbs, just stuff like that that will naturally make your water weight drop. You can do stuff like loading up on distilled water, which is also not fun to do and not great for your system. But if you're going to do that, I would recommend a week out, start drinking like a gallon and a half of distilled water every single day. And then starting to taper that down to a gallon every day, to half a gallon every day, until you're just not drinking any water the day you are trying to cut the weight. And you'll see the weight just kind of fly off. Distilled water is not good for you, though. Again, your the proper methodology you can do is just diet down. And then these are for extreme weight cuts. If you only have to lose a pound, just get up early in the morning of the tournament and lose the weight that way. That is my recommendation, but again, we don't want to cut water weight. Cutting water weight takes a lot out of your performance. I've had matches just go completely terribly because I was in good shape, but I cut a lot of water weight, so I got fucking exhausted, and then when you're exhausted, you're basically a white belt again. <laughs> so I don't want to do that. So just a little bit on cutting water weight and dieting. Now, am I going to forget all of my techniques? Well, that depends on how well you manage your nerves, depends on your cardio, depends on your muscular conditioning. The more tired you get, the harder it is to actually go for shit. And the answer, it, it might even be yes, you're going to forget a lot of shit. And the way to deal with that is to drill. 
Okay, I am notorious for doing 10,000 reps of multiple move sets and multiple chains. Okay, this is uh, Heath has had has been doing this since we were white belts, and I always find something I want to work on and I drill it for a month. Okay, and those 10,000 reps can be live reps, they can be resistance drilling, they can be just pure reps. I, I tend to vary it up, and I have whole videos talking about how to drill, but you should be drilling. Okay, you want to make a lot of your move sets and a lot of your moves subconscious you don't want to think about them so i always want to be that guy that when i'm having my worst day possible i stayed it for two days straight on a fucking video game binge and i my brain's just completely fried and fuzzed out i want to be able to do my moves still i want to have my autopilot be extremely crisp and ready to go and the way you do that is to physically rep out the moves so if you have time or you should make time Get a couple partners that are willing to do hundreds of reps with you. You can't just rep something 20 times and expect to be able to pull it off at a tournament when you can't even see straight. Okay, you've got to do thousands of reps if you really want to get the most benefit out of this. You want to become a well-oiled machine in jiu-jitsu, not just somebody who's good on their best day. Now, the next thing that people really struggle with in their first tournaments is how to actually play their own game. It took me probably 10 tournaments, honestly, before I was able to play what I would have considered my game at the time in tournament settings. I was just too nervous, I was reactive a lot of the time, or I was just on pure autopilot a lot of the time. I wasn't thinking ahead, I wasn't setting stuff up properly. Uh, it was sloppy. I won all my tournaments, but it wasn't wins I felt good about, you know, because I knew my technique was just completely terrible. So the way to deal with this is actually to, to, to do mental reps and to pay attention more when you drill. A lot of this gets taken care of just by drilling appropriately and drilling frequently, but you've got to be doing stuff outside of your drilling time. So when I, I, I'm obsessed with jiu-jitsu, guys. I'm autistic as fuck, and I think about this shit all the time. And when I really get obsessed with a move set, I, I, it just plays in the back burner of my brain all the time. I'll wake up fucking shrimping in bed. That can't be normal. And... It actually benefits me a lot, though. Okay, f uh, there, there have been a lot of studies that show that mental reps, if you can do a mental rep to the point where you can kind of, phys like in your brain, recreate the physics of the movement to the point where your muscles almost twitch doing it, you're getting a similar benefit to physically repping it, except the difference is you're there, you're cognizant of what's going on, whereas a lot of people zone out when they're repping their moves. So you can't zone out when you're repping your moves. You gotta be paying attention, you gotta be thinking about the moves you're doing. But also think about it ahead of time. You start recreating matches in your head where you do exactly what you think you're supposed to do. You know, play it out. Play the scenarios out. See what would happen. Think up counters. Okay? Think what would I do if they do this and have those ready to go ahead of time. And the more of this network you can build in your head, the more comfortable you're going to be going out there and pushing the pace. But your first tournament itself, your goal should be to at least pull off some kind of positive actions. You know what I mean by that is like, instead of letting the guy grab you and he pulls guard, you shot on an ankle pick on him, okay? Or you pulled guard to a guard and you immediately went on an attack, okay? I want you guys to think about positive, like I try to recreate a positive bias towards action in my jiu-jitsu, which means anytime I'm pausing, instead of pausing, what I should be doing is something, whether that's pushing a leg down, reaching up for the collar, pulling you out of position, moving you around, moving a leg, switching a grip, baiting a grip. It's endless. This is what skill in jiu-jitsu is. The problem is people don't do stuff. People have a horrible bias towards hesitation and reactivity. And that is not how you win at a local level, and that's not how you win at a high level, or at least not in a way you're going to feel good about. If you want to really guarantee you're going to win your first tournament, practice being the guy that initiates the moves in class and in your middle matches, even if you fuck it up and fail. Again, failure doesn't matter. People have this egocentric bias in jiu-jitsu where they don't want to go for stuff in training because they might miss it and the guy's going to, you know, he maybe gets in your back off of Baron Bolo you try to do, you fucked up. Ch chokes you out, you restart the match, you try it again. Eventually it's going to work and eventually you're going to hit that move on someone in a tournament. So you've got to keep track of your actual goals. My goal is always to beat the fuck out of the best person in the world. I don't care who it is, I don't give a fuck. It's just my ideal image of what perfect jiu-jitsu looks like. That's who I train for. Okay, and if you think like that and you train like that, you will be ready for that first tournament match. Now, you probably have a coach that's competed at some point, okay? This is just a quick video on how to kind of deal with some of the pitfalls you're going to run into in your first tournament setting and first tournament match, but use your coach as a resource. So ask your coach... And ask your friends to be at your match. Ask them to yell out to you. Ask them to coach you and actually tell you what to do. 
I've had lots of times where I was, I was, my brain was fuzzing for a second, and I heard fucking Heath yelling, "God damn it, Andrew, put your hand here!" And I do it. Like it reminded me, and that's the best thing you can really get out of a coach. They're not going to do the match for you. They're, they're there. Okay, they're there to remind you to do the stuff you already do. So if you're a coach and you're coaching someone who's in his first match, don't yell out to do a barambolo if you know the guy doesn't know how to do a barambolo. It's not part of their game. Try to coach within their within their skill restraint that you're aware of. If you're if you have a good coach, he's aware of what you can do and can't do. So that shouldn't really be too much of an issue. Get your match recorded, okay? Because again, win or lose, we need to be able to learn from the failure. Get your fucking cell phone out. Hand it to your wife. Hand it to your kid. Hand it to someone. Beg a pedestrian, (laughs) okay? Get it recorded so you can go over it afterwards and you can see what you actually did wrong. A lot of the stuff that is part of my A game now is only part of my A game because I ran into a problem in a tournament and the solution happened to be the movesets that I now do. Because I went back and I watched it and I'm like, fuck, I wish I knew how to counter De La Hiva better. Fuck, I wish I knew how to pass a lasso better. So I went and I made it a big a big part of my focus for a long time to do those better. And now I have ex- excellent De La Hiva and lasso passing. Whereas before I was, you know, when I was a blue belt, I, I might get stuck in those positions against higher level guys. So you need to get them recorded. Ask people to record them. You don't, to, you don't need to post it. You don't need to be ashamed of it when you're watching it. Just get it on film so you can review it yourself and you can get the benefit out of it. Because again, we don't we we learn more from wins than we do from losses. But you can't learn from a loss if you don't analyze why you lost. So this has been a quick video on some of the stuff you're gonna run into when you first start competing, your first match, your first tournament. Uh I just wanted to have something out there for the people that are competing for the first time. There's a lot of tournaments coming up all the time, and it's a very common question that I get asked on Instagram and Patreon and everything. It's like, what do I need to do to get ready for my first tournament? So here it is. You guys go out there, practice, feel confident, feel ready, have some anxiety management stuff. All right. I want to talk about managing that anxiety a little bit, some of the tricks that work for me and some of the tricks that don't work for me. So a lot of people, before they do their tournaments, they like to listen to music. Okay, they have sound cance- they have sound canceling headphones on. They're vibing out, and that's what works for them. That's great. Okay, It's something you should try. If it's not for you, that I understand, it's not really for me. I am obnoxious. I go find my opponents, and I talk to them in the most friendly way that I possibly can. I'm a friendly guy. And... I make them wish they could hate me, but they can't because I'm so goddamn nice, (laughs) okay? I compliment them. I I fucking talk about how they're going to steal my girlfriend. You know, that just makes me feel better. It makes me less anxious, all right? Other things I've tried doing, I've tried every time I felt that anxiety raising up, just going, ha! And fucking scaring the shit out of everybody around me. (laughs) And that worked. It was like I was yelling the anxiety out of my system. I looked like a psychopath, but I went out there and fucking rolled like a psychopath, (laughs) which was good. Full on bus on display. Um... Some people like to sit by themselves. You know, I've tried that. I've, I've gone on by myself and I've just quietly read a book. I've warmed up really well. You should warm up before your tournaments. Uh, but you should warm up in ways that you warm up for class. If you don't warm up at all before you do class and before you start rolling, you should do a really light warm up. Now, ideally, you're doing a hard warm up before your classes like the D1 wrestlers do. Uh, but very few people do that. But don't push yourself out of your comfort zone doing a warm up that's going to make you actually exhausted. That's not worth it. And the thing about stretching out before you compete is that it can actually affect your muscle fatigue, okay? You are actually doing work when you're stretching, especially when you're stretching hard. And I've read studies that it really can actually affect how quickly your muscles are going to exhaust. For me, it's not worth it, okay? So I don't stretch before my tournaments. I mean, I stretch all the time, but I don't stretch specifically before I go out there and roll at a tournament. And I think that should do it, guys. That is my quick guide on how to deal with the different pitfalls you're going to run into when it comes to your first competition. I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to like and subscribe. Share the video if you thought it was helpful. Uh, We have a Patreon account that's got a fuckload of people in it. We really appreciate all the support we got. We've got benefits for the Patreon accounts. We do video reviews. We do live review sessions with the person. We do uh, private lessons and we have the, the wizard tier where we actually just coach the fuck out of you as much as we can. And we also have a ton of instructionals on BGD Fanatics. And if you guys don't care about any of that, I hope I'll see you in the next video. So, everyone have a good day. Remember to eat their Panda Express. You guys are awesome.